Hey there. I've been thinking about upgrading my home server for a few years now. Since 2017, I've been running my media server off of a 20 terabyte Promise Pegasus 2 disk array, connected over Thunderbolt 3 to a Mac Mini. Good morning! At the beginning of 2024, it was around 90% full. In October, it reached 98%. So I knew it was finally time to get serious about upgrading. I mainly use this server for Plex and storing my library of retro games to play off my mister over my local network. And while it's hardly a true quote-unquote server, it's been able to get the job done pretty well. Moving forward, in addition to having way more storage for Plex and my games, I started getting into the home lab scene and learning all about the neat things you can do with TrueNAS scale, Docker containers, and home networking. I figured if I'm going to spend the money on upgrading, I want it to last at least twice as long as my current setup, and also serve as a strong foundation that I can later upgrade if need be. I also figured I'd document the whole thing, so here we go. I looked at buying some off-the-shelf NAS solutions from companies like QNAP, but the cost of those arrays seem pretty steep for what you get. The processors in them range from low-power ARM chips to your run-of-the-mill consumer desktop chips, and still you have to buy the hard disks yourself so we're talking upwards of five, maybe six thousand dollars. I knew if I could source the parts myself, I could build a comparable server for less. I know eBay can be good for finding used server hardware, and I figured I could probably find some decent deals on some perfectly fine CPUs, PCI Express cards, and other components I might need. Procuring the hard disks would be the most expensive task, but I wouldn't really want to cheap out on that anyway. However, it turns out finding a suitable enclosure for my ideal server was the trickiest piece of the puzzle. I had seen reviews of various John's Bow enclosures on YouTube and more serious enterprise grade stuff like the 45 Drives HL15. I didn't really want to break the bank on an enclosure though, but with so many of the lower cost options seemingly catering toward a more casual use case, I felt hung up on this part of my search. I also don't have a ton of room where I live to house a massive server. I'd love it if I had my own personal server closet with a dedicated climate control system and sound dampening and all of that stuff, but that's probably never going to happen realistically. So this new server should be small enough to fit within my current space without sacrificing things like performance, reliability, and noise level. But so far, I wasn't finding anything to my liking. Then, on November 11th, 2024, I noticed Chris Person of Highlight Reel and Aftermath.site posted on Blue Sky a server chassis he found while researching NAS parts for an article he was working on. I saw this post and the chassis immediately stood out to me. It looked more professional than any of the low-end enclosures out there, and it was somehow listed at under $200. I thought, surely there must be some kind of catch here. Further research into it led me to an excellent blog post on BytePursuits.com, which went into extreme detail on the chassis, from contacting the vendor, the ordering process on Taobao, packaging quality, measurements, the whole nine yards. I was beginning to see that this chassis was legit, and the only real barrier was that I had to order it direct from the manufacturer in China and wait a few months for it to arrive, unless I were to pay close to like $200 for shipping. So, on sort of a whim, I decided this was the one to get. I placed an order through Alibaba, and then I waited. While I waited, I built up a small arsenal of hardware that would someday soon live inside that enclosure. I ordered an ASRock Rack Rome D8 2T ATX server motherboard. I found a used AMD Epic 16 core 32 thread CPU on eBay for $85. I ordered 128 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC RAM, a terabyte of M.2 NVMe storage, an Intel Arc A380 GPU for Plex transcoding, I got an 850 watt Corsair power supply, 
I picked up a Broadcom 9500 HBA on eBay. I got a massive Noctua cooler for the CPU, five 92mm Noctua exhaust fans, and three 120mm Noctua intake fans. I picked up two 64GB 2.5 inch SSDs that I would use for my TrueNAS boot mirror. And finally, I somehow scored 12 14 terabyte Seagate Exos Enterprise drives for close to $10 a terabyte from a seller on eBay. With everything coming out to a grand total of around $4,100, I would have 110 terabytes of storage on a robust, enterprise grade server with room to grow in the future. So about two months go by and the chassis finally arrives. I was impressed with the build quality right away. Everything about the front of the chassis looked good, and everything was where it should be, nothing was loose. It came with this box of screws, fan guards, rubber feet, and some white gloves. I started the build process by removing the top panel, which is held in with two screws, and it just slides off like this. Like I said, the build quality is good. These are all steel panels, not aluminum, so it feels real sturdy and not flimsy at all. Even the exhaust fan assembly is made of steel and has these nice captive thumb screws for ease of access. Getting a closer look at the inside, this is where the motherboard will go. There are these side exhaust vents with some thin foam adhered to them. We've also got some front I.O. with a USB 3.0 header and your standard power button and LED headers. There's also a removable 2.5 inch drive caddy as well. Onto the back plane, you can see the Molex power connectors, plenty of fan headers, actually more than necessary it seems, as well as the SFF8643 connectors, and then some dip switches for overriding the default fan speeds. Onto the drive caddies, I'd say they feel pretty good. They're not up there with true enterprise grade caddies like something from NetApp, obviously. They're not toolless, so you have to manually screw in each drive. But aside from that, the action on them feels pretty nice and uh, the buttons are real springy. The next thing I did was remove the ears and subsequently the front panel to install the intake fans. I wasn't going to rack mount this thing, so the ears weren't necessary. The front panel has this thin grille tacked on with what looks like double-sided tape. This is probably the cheapest part of the entire case if I'm being honest. However, it doesn't appear that it's going to pose a problem down the road. Just in terms of overall build quality, this feels like it could have been done better. Maybe a proper dust filter would have been nice. There's also another optional pass-through window on the front there, which I'm not sure what the use case would be, but it's there should you need it. Once I got the intake fans mounted, I mounted the power supply, I wired up the back plane using the daisy chain Molex cable included with my power supply. I've seen that this isn't recommended, and you should provide each connector with its own 12 volt rail, but I think my PSU can handle it, and it would have added a huge mess of cable clutter otherwise. Next I wanted to route the SFF cables from the back plane up into the motherboard tray using the pass through channel on the right side. Then it was time to get started on the motherboard itself. I ended up getting this motherboard brand new, and I've been really impressed with it. I've had ASRock boards in the past for gaming computers I've built, but this is the first server board I've bought from them, and just the number of PCI slots on this thing, the 8-channel memory support, there's so many things to like about it. It's got a dedicated BMC, so as long as there's standby power to the machine, I can log into the IPMI and manage the server fully remote. Now onto the CPU. The packaging on this was a little sketchy, so I wasn't sure what I was going to end up with. I hadn't fully examined it just quite yet. This is also the first time I've installed an SP3 socket type CPU and I kind of made a mistake with installing it since you're supposed to use a torque driver and I didn't have one. So yeah, don't do what I did. Get a torque driver, do it correctly. Don't try to eyeball it and hope for the best. Uh, it worked out for me, I don't know, but if I could do it all over again, I would just go pick up a torque driver.
And now the moment of truth, taking a look at this epic chip I got off eBay. I noticed there was a few minor blemishes on the lower left quadrant there. You can see there's maybe some slight scuffing from where it was previously socketed. I wasn't too concerned about this, since at the end of the day this thing was less than 100 bucks, so if it ended up being a dud I could just source another one. So here I'm trying to keep things just finger tight. Again, don't do this, get a torque driver. I don't know if I just got lucky or what, but it's now been running for over a month without any issues. That's not to say something couldn't happen later down the line, but you know, I don't know. After getting the CPU socketed in, it was time to mount the knock to a cooler. I cleaned off the IHS with some isopropyl alcohol and applied thermal paste in the suggested 13 dot pattern for these EPIC CPUs. I decided to get the RAM modules installed next before attaching the fans to the cooler as there's no way I'd be able to socket those in with them attached. Next I got the NVMe drive installed. There are two M.2 slots on this board, and I am planning on getting a second NVMe drive so I can create a, another mirror. I'm mostly using the NVMe storage right now as a scratch disk for running containers and other things like that that I don't really care about losing data for. So it's not a huge deal if the drive fails, but I will get a second one in there just to have the redundancy. Now it's time to actually get the board mounted, now that all the bigger components have been installed. Here I'm just using the included standoff screws that came with the chassis. And as you can see, even with the intake fans installed, everything fits in quite nicely. There's plenty of room inside this chassis for a full-size ATX board. Once I got everything tightened down, just taking an overview of the inside, I got the additional network card inserted. And next was to get the HBA installed. This was a little tricky just with the cable bend here. I chose short run SFF cables because I didn't want to have extra cable slack taking up space. It did end up working out just fine, but the bends in these cables is a little concerning. Again, I haven't had any issues thus far. Next, I got the graphics card installed. Then I got all the exhaust fans for the hard drives mounted to the fan caddy. And here's just a look at everything cabled up. Got the 2.5 inch drives installed as well. It's a little tight back there with that one intake fan, but it seems like there's enough flow through so that air can pass through everything. And here I've got all the drives already installed, and I'm just initializing them, getting everything ready to go for the TrueNAS scale install. With everything set up and working how I want it, I'm very pleased with how this turned out. The server sits neatly inside my entertainment center, so it's nice and out of sight. I have TrueNAS scale configured to use all 12 drives in a 2 VDEV RAID Z2 6 wide layout. I'm running close to 30 Docker containers at any given moment, and the Epic CPU hardly seems to notice. From a power consumption perspective, the server pulls around 120 watts at idle and 230 watts under load. I'm also quite impressed with the noise level. Obviously if there's a lot of disk activity, the disks are going to be perceptible, but compared to the 6 disks that were in my promise array, these sound about as loud as those did. Maybe the fact that these new drives are hermetically sealed with helium makes them sound a bit quieter? I'm not sure. Fan noise is also not really a factor since they're all Noctua fans, and I can just barely make it out that the fans have ramped up if I listen closely. As for what else I'm running on it, besides Plex and SMB shares, I have a slew of Docker containers as I mentioned. Many are in service of automating my Plex library in terms of acquisition and organization. I feel like I've effectively removed about 70% of the manual upkeep that I used to have to do in managing my server. I have other tools like Grafana for tracking server metrics and monitoring my UPS. I have some Linux virtual machines, a Nextcloud instance, Cloudflare DNS with proxy integration so I can access my server from the internet, and I'm running Tailscale so I can create a secure VPN tunnel into my home network from anywhere. 
So I think that about does it. Um, really happy with the way this all turned out. Definitely check this server chassis out if you are interested in building something similar. Um, I'll leave links in the description below for the chassis, the blog posts, and everything that I purchased. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. Sorry if this video was too long or you thought it was rambly and weird. Um, I'm usually more inclined to make shorter, tighter edited things, but for this I just kind of wanted to go wild a bit and uh, thought it would give me a good opportunity to get familiarized more with DaVinci Resolve. So, But um, yeah, either way, hopefully somebody got something out of this. But if not, uh, there's always next time. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye.